Um, welcome to uh, Critique 213. We, are, we have temporary uh, sound issues uh, in that the mics aren't working right now. Uh, but we are in communication with everybody who should be able to fix it shortly. So I'm going to try and speak as loudly as I can. Is this working? Yes? OK. Uh, Nadia, come on in. There's seats here. There's a seat here. Just come in front. Just come in front. OK. So welcome, everyone. Um, we turn today uh, to our first substantive texts. First, Horkheimer's 1937 article, Traditional and Critical Theory, which laid out a blueprint for his vision uh, of the research project and method of the Institute for Social Research at the University of Frankfurt, paired with Adorno's own blueprint uh, six years earlier in 1931 for his vision of philosophical research and method, uh, which was his article entitled The Actuality of Philosophy, delivered as the inaugural lecture on the occasion of his entry into the philosophy department at the University of Frankfurt. Now, I propose that we pair these two very different texts because of the subsequent history of Horkheimer and Adorno's close intellectual collaboration uh, as a way to explore the tensions, hopefully fruitful tensions, um, in their points of departure. Now, as you know, history, of course, would push Horkheimer and Adorno into closer collaboration uh, during the war, leading to their monumental text, Dialectic of Enlightenment. But I wanted to start here earlier uh, to explore the seeds of the tensions between their thoughts. And I wanted to begin in conversation with my dear friend and colleague here at Columbia, Axel Honneth, who is the Jack C. Weinstein Professor of the Humanities in the Department of Philosophy uh, at Columbia, the C4 Professor Emeritus of Social Philosophy, uh, and the former director of the Institute for Social Research at the Goethe University in Frankfurt. And of course, uh, he is one of the most formidable thinkers on and of the Frankfurt School. Now, at our last seminar, we were discussing methods of reading, critical methods of reading, and several were proposed, you will recall. Lydia Gore had uh, proposed an Adornian uh, method of reading, one that takes philosophical texts like artworks as having a history, a reception, an afterlife, uh, as she argued, uh, that calls on us to do justice to the social truth context of the texts. Nadia Urbanati had urged us not to rest lazily uh, on those texts and not distort them, but to speak in our own voices. And Etienne Balibar had proposed a more Deleuzean method of reading as a form of dramatization that turns the text into a battlefield. Now, you will recall that Axel Honneth had proposed four different legitimate forms of reading. Um, but he had favored one, which was the dialogical, or what he called the dialogical. By contrast to the more philological, or that was the first category, the second was the ideological reading, uh, where you're actually trying to extract the ideology from the text, or the fourth, which was the more instrumental presentist reading, uh, Axel leaned towards a dialogical method of reading to be in permanent dialogue with the text. The effort there, I think, is to figure out how the text is in conversation with one's own work and to be interested in his own words, in whether the text speaks to me. Right? To reject the parts of the critical text that you don't understand, to figure out what you can, uh, and in that way to be in conversation with the text. And Axel, you had mentioned at the last seminar that you've been in dialogue with Hegel all your intellectual life in that dialogical way. Well, one of the main reasons I wanted to start today uh, the conversation with you is, of course, uh, because you've also been in dialogue uh, for all of your intellectual life 
uh, with Horkheimer and Adorno, especially Horkheimer, more so than Adorno, I think. But um, you have been in dialogue with these particular texts uh, for your life. And I'm thinking here, of course, of your brilliant first book, uh, The Critique of Power, um, which was published in 1985, uh, which actually starts from a dialogue with uh, this text, critical, uh, Traditional and Critical Theory by Horkheimer. And what, what animated uh, that book of yours was your finding of a sociological deficit in Horkheimer's essay, the essay that we're going to be studying today. In fact, it was to repair and um, to overcome that sociological deficit uh, in this article that you turned first to the writings of Michel Foucault on relations of power uh, as a way to kind of infuse uh, the notion of, um, of conflict, uh, but then ultimately that you turned at that time to Habermas's communicative action theory. And it was in dialogue with Horkheimer and then with Habermas that you were able to reconstruct a critical social theory for our times. And I think that was pretty clear from the text uh, in other words, one could see that dialogical method in the text, but it was oriented towards the present. It was oriented towards reconstructing a social, a critical social theory for the present. And in fact, um, and in fact, you you wrote at the time, right, that the cent the central problem for a critical social theory today is thus the question of how the conceptual framework of an analysis has to be laid out so that it is able to comprehend both the structures of domination and the social resources for its practical overcoming. And what was missing in Horkheimer, I take it, was the social resources for its practical overcoming, which was what you were able to extract, find, and draw from Habermas's work. Now, I would argue that that method was in itself, in part dialogical, in the way you were speaking last week. But it also contained, I think, an element of the text as a battlefield, uh, in uh, Etienne Baribas' sense, in the sense that it was, you were, you were finding the sociological deficits uh, in that text. Um, and it also contained, I believe, the fourth method, uh, closer to mine, I would say. Um, which you called instrumental. Of course, no one likes the term instrumental. It's a derogatory term, so we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't do that, right? We don't, we're not instrumental. I, I kind of uh, willingly embraced provocatively other terms that we don't like, like presentist um, or even uh, brutalist uh, was what I uh, was playing with last time. But um, I think it did have uh, an, that element, because the, the idea was to construct a critical social theory for today. Maybe, today. maybe today I will simply call that fourth approach engaged, an engaged critical reading, right? Because that's less derogatory. But it had an element of an engaged reading, um, especially regarding Habermas, I think, uh, since he was so central to rejuvenating critical social theory. Now, I also think that that's an approach that you've used more recently uh, in your more recent book, uh, one of your more recent books, but in the idea of socialism, um, where, of course, it's not so much a text that you are playing with or working with or manipulating or, or, or working on, but an idea, the idea of socialism. Um, and in that sense, that goes also back to some discussions we were having with Etienne last week about the text versus other resources, or the narrowing of this seminar to text and the problematic narrowing. But there it wasn't a narrowing, it was focused on the idea. And what you did there, I think, was that you extracted, you took out the historical context of the idea of socialism. You stripped the idea of its uh, context of the Industrial Revolution. You stripped it also of its Marxist philosophy of history and assumptions about the proletariat, and then you infused it or steeped it uh, in the sphere of political deliberation. Uh, there too, there were birth defects in the, in the original idea that needed to be um, uh, 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 eliminated and replaced. Um, and, uh, and of course, what they were replaced with or what they are infused with instead are a notion of democratic politics, uh, resulting in a somewhat experimentalist vision of socialism there. 
In that sense, that work too uh, represented an effort I would propose to wrestle the idea of socialism, <coughs> to extract it from its historical origins, and to infuse it with new ideas, which may well be dialogical also, uh, but I think it is engaged in that fourth sense as well. Enough now, though, with methods of reading, uh, at least the methods, the critical methods that we'll be using in this seminar. Let's turn now, or rather return now, to the actual text itself uh, and to the two formative texts from the 1930s uh, to see what work uh, they can do for us possibly today. So, um, Axel? Yes, sure. Thanks. Now, this, are you gonna ha this does not work, sadly. Okay. So you're going to have to project as much as possible. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much for the... I apologize for that. It's no problem. I hope it's not a problem. Can you, can you understand me? So in the case I'm getting uh, less loud, you have to tell me immediately. Yeah. So uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, to Bernard for the invitation to discuss these two eminent texts with you. Before I will give my own short accounts of these two texts, let me shortly come back to the question of readings. I couldn't resist to say something about this. Um, and this, again, has to do with the question how to understand the different alternatives that were presented last time in our discussion. And uh, I will not mention again one of the types I uh, thought it's worthwhile to bring into view, namely what I called ideology critique. I mean, I think this is a very useful form of reading texts, namely by reconstructing their ideological content, if they have an ideological content, but very often texts have such an ideological content. And Adorno, when reading Hegel, was sometimes doing exactly that, yeah? to find out to what degree a certain piece of a Hegel text incorporates an ideological content. For example, by legitimizing the Prussian state or something like that. So I leave that out. Uh, I would like to, co come, uh, to come back to two of the other types, namely what I called a phil philologist reading and to what you called now engaged reading. Huh? Um, I think it would be a misconception of what a brilliant philologist could accomplish when we would take it not as a kind of serious undertaken. And I even would go so far to say that what Etienne called the text as a battlefield is a slightly over-dramatized version of what I, what I would call a good philological reading. Because all good philological readings have to under, uncover in the text the tensions the possible struggles with which the author is, uh, by which the author, author is kept. So I give you an example. I have a close friend in Germany who is now editing uh, the third critique by Kant in the new edition. And that's an enormous heavy work. But what she has to do is to reconstruct all important notions Kant is using by making clear what the meaning in the time was and to what degree Kant was using a certain notion by refusing other meanings, by attacking other authors, even when that is not visible on the surface. So what a good philologist has to do, he or she has to reconstruct the text that it becomes visible, to what degree such texts are the results of encounters with others, sometimes battlefields. I mean, if you take Quentin Skinner, for him, all texts are battlefields. I mean, each text by Hobbes is a battlefield because Hobbes always wants to reject 
his opponent, I mean, the Conservative Party, I mean, or the more, uh, the, the, the more Republican Party. <coughs> so I think there is not really a difference between such a battlefield, battlefield metaphor and good philological, best philological reading. And one other word to engaged reading. Engaged sounds for me very different to a word you also used today, manipulative reading. You said manipul manipulation at one time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Manipulation is, I think, another word for something you used last time, two weeks ago, in order to reject the metaphor, namely the metaphor of the toolbox. Mm -hmm. To take a text as a toolbox means, in my view, to simply use elements of a text instrumentally in, in that sense that you want to take elements out of, out of it which are helping your present concerns. You don't care about the context of the text. You simply ignore the context. You ignore the ambition or intention of the text. You, you, you have somewhat manipulative engagement with the text. Engagement is not the right word. A manipulative relation to the text that I called instrumentalist. Engaging is, in my view, not different from a dialogical reading. I mean, with the dialogical reading, I had, in the beginning, I had uh, Gadama in view. I mean, Gadama is probably the best on that kind of understanding, interpretation. Uh, and he would say, all reading has to be engaged or dialogical because you can't understand even the meaning of the text if you are not in dialogue with it. And in, to be in a dialogue with it means to try to understand, to reject where you can't understand, and to be in that sense, in a permanent dialogue with the text. And I think this is the way we should read texts when we are sitting here. And I wouldn't mind to call it engaged, yeah? because, I mean, what, what does engagement mean? It means I bring my own interests in dialogue with the text, my own concerns, which are concerns of today, in dialogue with a given text. And I, I'm not repressing my, my present concerns, no. I'm bringing my concerns in a dialogue so that I, I possibly reject those parts of a text which are not longer speaking to me, and I, I take up and even, uh, I mean, I, I take on those parts of the text of which I think I can operate with them. I can, I can understand them and not even understand them. I can continue their contents and their meaning. So in that sense, I think between engaged reading and dialogic reading, I don't see a big difference. And so we will prove uh, today yeah, yeah, yeah. probably what kind of readings we have. So um, let me come to the two texts. Uh, and um, I, will, I will do my best to give you a short account of the two texts, and then we can come into a dialogue about the relevant, the importance, and yeah even the meaning of the text, because both texts are not easy, especially the Adorno text is, in my view, extremely complicated. Mm -hmm. It was written at a certain time. You can see that Adorno was already partly influenced by Walter Benjamin, yeah? uh, and that he is living in a certain philosophical atmosphere, full with discussions on Husserl, the early Heidegger, who plays a certain role, Max Scheler, I mean, the whole phenomenological tradition. So he is in dialogue with all these traditions. In the 20s and 30s of the, 19th cent of the 20th century in Germany. And what makes the, 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 the text so difficult, in my view, is that the proposal he then is developing is not easy to understand. Yeah, I mean, this whole idea of constellative thinking. So I will say something about that. But let me start with uh, Horkheimer's text, a text I have to say 
that I never really liked. Um, and uh, out of many reasons. I, first, I think it's much too long. Yeah. Um, so it would have been much better if it would have been shorter. Then I think he has not a clear solution for the central problem in the text. And I will uh, justify why I believe that. So Hockhammer is developing in his text what I call a functionalist interpretation of all sciences or theoretical undertakings. You also could say a pragmatist uh, interpretation, or you could say um, an action theoretical interpretation of all sciences. Because he's claiming that all sciences or theoretical undertakings have to be understood as the reflexive continuations of pre-theoretical problem solving within and by human action. That is, in fact, a very pragmatist view on the sciences. It is as if he had read Dewey, somebody he never liked, and he rejected his whole life. But the whole opening of the text is a, is a variation of a Deweyan thought, without mentioning Dewey. Theory is fulfilling the function to increase, by the production of knowledge, the efficiency of problem solving as it is provided by actions that are basic for human reproduction. The kind of action in which science is rooted as being its reflexive continuation or enhanced continuation is, as Horkheim is naming it, work the practical effort to get control over nature. That's a Marxist perspective, yeah, clearly. I mean, sciences are rooted in a specific type of action, namely work. Traditional is science, or the sciences, because it has no knowledge, knowledge about its own practical rootedness. And since it has forgotten that it is the intellectual part of the permanent effort to control nature, it can be called positivistic. Positivism is for Horkheimer the name for a science or intellectual endeavor that has lost out of sight that it has a practical purpose inscribed in the kind of action of which it is the continuation, the reflexive continuation. However, this positivism is not the fault of the individual researcher or scientist. It is the outcome of the fact that human mankind as such within its own history has so far not yet realized that it is the subject of progress in the control over nature. That is, by the way, a Lukacian motive. Yeah? When you read history and class consciousness, what Lukács wants to say, because subjects in the contemporary society, capitalism, are passive normally, they don't have the right view on history. It is only one class that has the correct view on history, namely the proletariat, because the proletariat is able to see that it itself is the agent of all historical progress and all historical development. So it's something like that in the background. It's, um, there's a, a lot of Lukács in the text, I guess. So um, this unawareness of the, of the fact that the subject of uh, historical progress is human mankind. This uh, unawareness is the consequence of the fact that up until now, the economy, the economic structures, were not organized in a transparent way so that everyone would be able to understand that humanity is the real subject or agent of the permanently growing productivity of work within history. Given this functionalist or pragmatist premises of his article, Horkheimer is forced now, in its second part, to give such a functionalist account also for what he calls critical theory. He has to demonstrate that critical theory, well understood, is also rooted in some kind of human activity that allows it to have the correct view on the fabric of human history, namely that it is human mankind that is behind all progress in the overcoming of natural determinations and limitations. 
It is my guess that Horkheimer offers in his article two very different answers to this question of how to understand the practical roots of critical theory. On the one side, he seems to believe that such knowledge is embedded in the work process itself, namely on a higher level as the awareness or the insight in the path the organization of work has to take in order to be fairly organized or more just, justly organized. On the other side, he seems to conceive of this practical activity in which critical theory is embedded as its intellectual or reflexive organ as the struggles and conflicts the dominated classes have to fight in order to reach fairer, more just living conditions and social structures. I could give you quotes that would justify my reading, that there are two very alternative ways of justifying, I mean for Horkheimer, of justifying, of, of demonstrating in what sense critical theory is root, rooted in a specific form of action, not in simple laboring or working, but in an other type of action. I think he's giving two answers, the one you find on page 212 and 213. If you want me, I could read it, but it takes a long time. And the other one you find on page 216 and 218. I mean, if it's necessary, I can read it later, probably. In my view, Hawkeye has undecided in his article about which of the two solutions to follow. Both answers are meant to explain why a critical theory is allowed to have a correct view on the fabric of human history, but in two very different ways, either by being part of the work progress on a higher second order level, as if critical theory is the self-reflection of the path work has to take in order to create a just society. This is almost a formulation he's using on one page. So either by being part of the work process on a higher second order level, or by being the intellectual expression of ongoing struggles for emancipation from domination and oppression. But the premises of both solutions are philosophically exactly the same, and I stress this because this makes a huge difference to Adorno's text. Human history is opaque and seems irrational only from the perspective of the participants who are unable to understand that they are the real agents of all progress in overcoming the forces of nature, whereas the philosophical observer or the critical theorist has knowledge of this fact. For him or her, the critical theorist, human history is rational in so far as it follows a path of progress rooted in the activity of human mankind to overcome natural determinations or to reduce natural forces. In Lukács' History and Class Consciousness from 1923, a book of highest importance for the Frankfurt School, this liberating emancipatory insight was still attributed to the proletariat. In Horkheimer, we do not, we do not find such an attribution to the opposite. I mean, Horkheimer expressly, expressively rejects this position, saying that the proletariat is meanwhile integrated. Yeah? This is 1937. And certain portions of the German proletariat had meanwhile voted for Hitler. So it's the clear thing to say that it is misleading to believe that the proletariat is still the revolutionary subject. So uh, Horkheimer reserves the liberating emancipatory knowledge to the critical theorist as a member of a small group of the academy. I mean, that's not the right word. I mean, to a small group of intellectuals. So Adorno, I coming now to the actuality of philosophy, begins his inaugural lecture with a statement that is clearly opposite to Horkheimer's view regarding human history and the hidden rationality of all social reality. He, Adorno, claims right at the beginning that all reality is not longer rational or reasonable 
neither from the perspective of the participants nor from the perspective of the theoretical observer. In some of his later writings, especially in the negative dialectics, he will say that reality became deprived, deprived of all rationality in the times of Hegel, around 1800. That's a very interesting remark, but he is very often repeating it. So that is the reason that he believes, uh, Adorno believes, that uh, Hegel therefore was the last philosopher who could convincingly attempt to do what is philosophy's highest purpose, namely to discursively capture the whole universe or reality as being rational. So that's an interesting passage that he is repeating sometimes in the text. He is very often saying that the true purpose of, of philosophy is to capture, re uh, to capture reality as being rational, but this highest purpose can't be served any longer because reality as such is deprived of any rationality or reasonability or whatever you want to have there. So Adorno continues then by arguing that because of the vanishing of rationality from reality, all philosophical ambitions have to fail today. Be it transcendental idealism in the footsteps of Kant, neo-Kantianism, be it phenomenology in the manner of Husserl or Max Scheler, these approaches all unsuccessfully attempt to find the methodological means to have access to some kind of rationality within reality. And these attempts terminate in Heidegger's philosophy that is for Adorno here a kind of vitalism. He's naming it vitalism, philosophy of life, but in the worst sense, uh, which, uh, with its premise of a being to death. That's a very simple and bad reading of Heidegger, but I leave this out. I mean, I think his reading of Heidegger never was really good. From all this results the question, if today philosophy, philosophy is at all capable of answering its cardinal question, namely how to conceive of the relation of reality and reason. Surprisingly, Adorno at this point attributes to the Vienna Circle, Carnap he is mentioning, and I think Schlick, the correct conclusion to abandon the search for reason in reality as such. An interesting move and surprising move, he is praising the Vienna Circle, which means logical positivism. And he's praising it because it has given up the pre-understanding that philosophy should aim for capturing reason within reality. Instead, logical po positivism claims that you have to take the given simply as the given. So, uh, it is by far for Adorno more convincing to take empirical facts as they are, namely without being filled with some kind of reason, than to look for such reason in reality in vain. However, Adorno's decisive step is then to claim that these facts have to be taken as something non-understandable, something that misses any meaning and therefore forms a kind of riddle for us. A central notion in this text. The notion riddle, I think, uh, bears a lot of importance here. I mean, it's, it's, I think, one of the central notions he's using. To take social reality as a riddle implies for Adorno to use a method of interpretation in order to make it understandable. Uh, understandable. But such hermeneutics has to be of a different kind than that one offered by the tradition. I guess he has here Diltai in view. I mean, the famous German representative of the hermeneutic tradition at that period. The later representative then became Gadamer, but before that you had Diltai. I think the Americans are even saying Diltai, but I'm not sure about this. <laughs> Which, by the way, is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, um, 
it does, I mean, this kind of understanding uh, that Adorno has in view does not operate with the pre-understanding that a text, the social reality, will gain any meaning after a long enough attempt of interpretation. It will instead remain without such meaning despite all hermeneutical efforts. Therefore, the critical understanding is aiming at unraveling social reality by trying to bring its different segments so long into constantly new groupings until suddenly a certain sense is disclosed. And sense is here a difficult notion. A certain, you could now say meaning, but you shouldn't confuse meaning here with intentional meaning. It has something like an objective meaning. Yeah? So this is important because he wants his own enterprise be differing from all traditional hermeneutics even when it's a very, it sounds very hermeneutical. So, like in solving a riddle. The notion Adorno is using for describing this method, method is constellation. The interpreter attempts by uh, applying exact fantasy, this is his notion, and knowledge of empirical facts, facts to disclose social reality by forming permanently new constellations of elements of that reality until, and I quote, the solution springs forth. The example Adorno is giving in this text is Marxian's concept of commodity structure, or commodity form. He's saying structure. I think form is the right word. This one notion, as a result of solving the riddle of capitalist economy or society, is meant to explain at a single stroke the truth of capitalism or its meaning, where meaning should not be confused with intentionality, reason, or rational stuff like this. Adorno is summing up his description of what a materialist cognition or knowledge is supposed to be by saying, and I quote page 35 in my edition, which is this one the Adorno reader, probably another one than the early Telos. 37, you said? 30, 30 what page? 35? Yeah, Did but you, you, must have, you must have another page, I, have I think. It. Ah, you have it. Yeah, I have it all. Uh, it is 35. So one, 130 in the Telos. 30 one, 130 in the Telos. Okay, 130 in Telos. So the, 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 uh, the sentence runs like, uh, like this. The point of interpretative philosophy is to construct keys before which reality springs open. And he adds that such knowledge can initiate praxis, page 34, one page earlier, obviously because it portrays reality in such a form or manner that it demands change or abolition. Abolition is his word. I think one way to understand better what Adorno had in mind when proposing this method, what he calls interpretative philosophy, might be to look in later examples of what can count as results of such a form of constellative or materialist, materialist interpretation. What comes to mind are then notions like cultural industry or administrative, administrative world, which try to bring, with a certain exaggeration, diverse elements of our social world together in a new way such that we suddenly are able to perceive something in it that was inaccessible for us before. Another way to make this method more understandable would be to compare, compare it with Max Weber's idea of ideal type that shares a lot of methodological features with Adorno's conceptual keys. I leave that out. I would love to comment on this, but I leave this out. So let me, in a last step, finally summarize the striking differences between Horkheimer and Adorno on the four levels of the concept of history, the concept of philosophy, the method, and the relation of theory to praxis. First, whereas Horkheimer takes social reality as being rational or reasonable when seen from the right angle, namely seen from the perspective of a critical 
his philosophy of history. When seen from this perspective, you suddenly realize that history is rational. It's following a certain rational purpose, namely, that's very Hegelian, the overcoming of natural determinations. That's also a Marxist view in his early writings, that work is the force which enables human mankind to reduce natural determinations. So Horkheimer takes social reality as being rational or reasonable when seen from the right angle. Adorno proceeds on the assumption that the social re world is today without any reason and therefore, thank you very much, regulated by blind nature-like laws. I mean, to read in this context his text on uh, natural history would be worthwhile because he's defending there this idea that human history so far is nothing else than natural history because it is regulated by blind laws. Second, whereas for Horkheimer, it is the task of a critical philosopher of history to demonstrate how reason as a human capacity operates within history as a driving force, for Adorno, it is the only remaining task for a critical philosophy to create with fantasy or imagination and acute knowledge, figures, his notion, or constellations, also his notions, notion, that enable us to perceive true features of the given reality that were inaccessible for us before. The differences between these two concepts of philosophy result from the alternative views concerning the existence or non-existence of reason in history. Third, the best method for Horkheimer to analyze the given social reality is by interdisciplinary research under the guidance of the before-mentioned philosophy of history. Whereas for Adorno, the adequate method for critical theory under the given circumstances is the solving of the riddle of a non-understandable, non-intentionally structured, one could say, reality by constructing key figures, as described before. Fourthly, Adorno believes that these figures might have the performative or aesthetic force to motivate a move to practical change, whereas Horkheimer insists that critical theory has to be the intellectual organ of already ongoing struggles and fights for the better. Let me say something about their later work, because it, when you read the dialectic of enlightenment, you can guess the, you can get the impression that they meanwhile have managed to synthesize their very different views. But I think, and I more and more believe, that is very misleading. Because uh, you can have two very different readings of the dialectic of enlightenment. You can have either a Horkheimer, Horkheimer reading of the dialectic of enlightenment, or you can have an Adorno reading. And if you read it either with one perspective or the other, the book reads very different, differently. So the Horkheimer reading would be such that the dialectic of enlightenment is delivering a negative history of philosophy. Yeah? I mean, this is the traditional reading, by the way. Yeah? Everyone would agree to say, what is presented there is that human history so far is in so far neg a negative process because it's the process of in, in the, the increase of instrumental rationality. And instrumental rationality is nothing else than control over nature and human beings. I mean, it's that reason you need in order to control nature and in order to control human beings. So history is the process of an increase of instrumental rationality, which is terminating in the totalitarianism of National Socialism and of Stalinism. And uh, so this is the Hokkaime, 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 Hokkaime reading. There is 
meanwhile, an Adorno reading of the dialectic of enlightenment, which uh, sounds completely different. You would say then that the dialectic of enlightenment is uh, delivering a sequence of what can be called figures or constellative metaphors that allow us to see the existing uh, social reality differently from how we are used to see it. So you could say the whole uh, usage of the Odysseus <coughs> myth or the whole chapter on the cultural industry are nothing else than the result of the construction of such figures with a certain, and this is I think true, a certain exaggeration. So these chapters are portraits of the given situation. It has nothing to do with a philosophy of history. It's simply a presentation of the present seen with the constructed figures that are even mentioned in the title of the different figures. So the chapter on cultural industry is not meant to be a chapter on a new stage in the history of uh, human mankind. The chapter on cultural industry is a chapter presenting the cultural situation of the present as if it is completely industrialized, completely capitalized, and this would be the result of the method Adorno had developed in his inaugural lecture. So that's a completely different reading. I think both readings are legitimate. Both are legitimate is, again, a word um, we can discuss. I think both readings are fine. I think the negative philosophy reading, the negative philosophy of history reading has some big disadvantages because I find it extremely unconvincing to say that all history from the beginning is is the unilateral process of an increase of instrumental rationality. I never found that very convincing. Uh, so I think the Adornian reading, reading is the more convincing one. Okay. Thank you, Axel. Um, <laughs> so let me, um, let me, begin where you end well no let me let me start from your your perspective let me make a, one or two tweaks or suggestions let me raise a couple of questions and then also uh, for you raise a few questions but then also propose something about using these texts um, in their engaged reading okay so um, in terms of uh, what you were proposing I'd like to suggest that the difficulty in both of their texts and in the resulting relationship between the texts is their own dialogical engagement with Marx. That is, in an odd way, what the texts share, the, the little that they share um, is their engagement with Marx, but it also creates a tension in the resulting, well, on both sides, but also then in the resulting uh, relationship between their theories. Now, um, uh, you mentioned at first this idea that the, one of the major differences is that for Horkheimer, you suggested he takes social reality as being rational or reasonable, and you say, when seen from the right angle. I mean, I would suggest that it's more that it can be rational under certain conditions. It's not rational in 1937. It's barbaric in some sense. It's un, un, it's, it, there's a lack of reason. But that his aim is for a perfectly rational society and that that is possible, organized rationally around economic uh, production. Uh, and so in his own words, the, the goal is to 16, the rational state of society, right? 
So it's not that it's rational now, but that it could be under uh, proper, uh, under a transformation that would have to be brought by the critical theorist leading the proletariat in a particular direction. Whereas for Adorno, of course, that possibility is be behind us. That possibility of, of a rational world is behind us. That, ration, that, that possibility of a, of a totality is behind us. It was the, the old project of philosophy and its old pretension to totality. Where, and so this is 25 or 120 in the Adorno text. Now, so that conflict, though, results in the fact right, that for Horkheimer, there is the possibility of a philosophical treatment of reality that gives us a totality, that, that makes everything fully coherent. Whereas for Adorno, we're working at a, at a lower level, at some kind of mid-level. And, and, and I think that was what you were getting at in, in a part, but maybe this is a way to rephrase it, that we're working at a, at a middle level. We, we're never going to achieve the totality. Instead, we're going to have particular uh, interpretations that solve the riddles, that solve the problems, uh, but we're working with concepts like class, for instance, right? That's, that the, the sociologists are at too much of a lower level uh, because they get too minute, too small, they deconstruct class too much so that we lose the traction of that category, but he wants to work at some level in, in the middle, right? And so it'd be the commodity form is his example, or class, it's somewhere in the middle. And, um, and, the, and, uh, and the result for Adorno is that there is this experimental and essayistic essay, as in an essay where he ends uh, his, his article. Uh, and, and where he extols the virtues of experimentalism, but at a middling level, right? And so that creates very different sensibilities to these two texts, but it, of course, it, it, it creates a fundamental problem because if indeed uh, the dialogic engagement with Marx would lead Adorno to a notion of class or commodity structure, that would tend to push it towards a more, a greater totality, a greater understanding of all of reality. Whereas, in fact, he's kind of holding on to the marks, but it's not leading to a grander vision, right? It's leading to particular solutions. That, if, that, that gives the, his approach a completely different texture, uh, which is this interpretive texture at a middling level, uh, a different sensibility. It almost feels more, in a way, kind of Geertzian in terms of an interpretation that's going to help us to understand the world a little bit, a little bit more, right? I mean, so Geertz's notion of a better interpretation is what, what did he say? He wrote that it's the further figures that issue from them, their capacity to lead to an extended account which intersecting other accounts of other matters, Geertz wrote, widens their implications, deepens their hold, but it's not, it's not gonna get you to this totality, right? Um, of course, the, the problem there is then what exactly is Marx doing or what work is Marx doing in Adorno's text, right? Um, it's clear what it's doing in Horkheimer's text because Horkheimer basically embraces most of the categories, uh, uh, <laughs> embraces categories of um, of uh, alienation, of the proletariat, of class conflict. It's, I mean, and there are passages where he's very explicit about this, right? I mean, he, in the postscript, he writes that critical theory as a way of knowing is based on Marx's critique of political economy. So he's pretty explicit about it, and the text reads in that way. Um, but instead, Adorno is kind of just using certain categories, ideas, at this different level. And so, um, that creates, I think, the greatest tension between these different texts. Um, and um, it's not clear how one could have such different sensibilities with a similar politics, right? And that's, that's, that, in part, is, I think, a riddle um, in, in between these two uh, texts. Now, the question I wanted to ask you about is the, is the praxis implications um, because um, it's pretty clear 
that for Horkheimer at this stage in 1937, and I think that his views are gonna change after and during the war and after, at this stage, he is writing about the unity of theory and praxis in a way in which theory dictates praxis here. Um, and you were mentioning, of course, this idea that yes, I mean, he mentions that you know the proletariat should be in the best position to understand their exploitation, but they're not because of ideological interference. He talks about false consciousness, and then he talks about the role of the critical theorist. And so the praxis implications are pretty clear for Horkheimer. Critical theorists are the ones who are able to see this totality and to uh, try to uh, eliminate the false consciousness, I think. Adorno, it's much less clear. Um, it is that passage that you referred to on page 34 uh, of your uh, collection. It's on 129 of the Telos uh, article. Yours is page 34. Um, it's Telos at uh, page 129 in the, in the middle of the page. Um, and, uh, and, and, and this is a passage I think that uh, it would be helpful to focus on uh, because it's not, it's not entirely clear uh, what he's suggesting. There's, there's a sense in which there, there's a praxis follows, follows theory here. Um, so he's writing about, um, the sentence is praxis is granted to, uh, earnestness means here that the answer does not remain mistakenly in the closed area of knowledge, but that praxis is granted to it. The interpretation of given reality and its abolition. So the notion here of being just the interpretive act, but also its abolition, its abolition which would require praxis, so I mean this is the practical side of it, are connected with each other, not of course in the sense that reality is negated in the concept, but that out of the construction of a configuration of reality, so out of some constellation, use of concepts, maybe commodity form or something, the demand for its real change always follows promptly. So it's as, if, it's as if at the middle level, the use of a concept like class or a constellation of concepts would then immediately prompt a demand for real change, right? And then, and then he refers to the 11th thesis. Um, he says, when Marx reproached the philosophers saying that they had only variously interpreted the world and contraposed to them that the point was to change it, then the sentence receives its le legitimacy not only out of political praxis, but also out of philosophic theory. And only in the annihilation of the question is the authenticity of philosophic interpretation first successfully proven. Um, and therefore, the annihilation of the question compels praxis. So, um, it's as if, it's as if out of a proper, out of an interpretation that gives us an objective, objective meaning, because it's not just a subjective interpretation, but an objective understanding will automatically flow uh, a demand uh, and will automatically flow praxis. Now, it's not entirely clear what that, what that means. Um, although the direction, again, as in Horkheimer, is from theory to praxis. Although you might even suggest that there could be some unity of theory and praxis here for Adorno, um, since it's so immediate, since it's immediately prompted. Now, this would change. I would argue, starting in at least in '44, in in, in uh, sh surely in uh, the eclipse of reason in '46, uh, Horkheimer is already kind of contesting the unity, and of course, Adorno famously would in you know the marginalia contest this unity. Think about no, it's it's a constant conflict. It's got to be a dialectical relationship. There is no unity, etc. But at this point in time, in part because of the place of Marx in these texts. Um, I think that there is a more direct link between theory and praxis, although my question would be, how, how, what exactly do we make, how do we make sense of this passage in Adorno? Um, 
and how do we and so and so the first question really is how do we make this how do we make sense of these different layers one of a possibility of a totalizing understanding of reality the other at this middling level um, and yet uh, Marx being in dialogue so those are the those are the questions but the, the final point I wanted to suggest is, of course, we are rereading these critical texts now uh, in part. In, 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 these, are, these are intended to be motivated readings, not just um, explaining the text, but uh, doing something with them. And so the question becomes, what could one find of compelling in these texts, or wh how could one be in dialogue with them. And of course, you've in the past, you have been in closed dialogue with them for your project. Uh, and so in the, crit the Critique of Power was a dialogic engagement that pushed it in a particular direction. I'd like to propose one quickly um, and then ask you perhaps where your thoughts are now on that. And then we can uh, open it up uh, to, to other questions and comments. I mean, what I, what I find most compelling about these texts is First, um, the emancipatory ambition. Uh, and of course, um, this is something that you discuss in your essay that we posted on the website, um, your essay called, Is There an Emancipatory Interest? An Attempt to Answer Critical Theory's Most Fundamental Question in the European Journal of Philosophy. I think, and, and, um, and you suggest there that Horkheimer, uh, by contrast to Marx, is locating that emancipatory ambition in, uh, you write, the ineradicable human tendency to revolt against structures of domination, right? So it's, it's not really located in the proletariat in the same way it might have been in Lukács or in Marx, but it's in the ineradicable tendency to revolt. Um, so, and, and I agree that that emancipatory ambition in these texts is compelling. And, um, and something that one can engage with and draw from uh, in one's own work. The second thing I would say is the direct engagement with praxis, uh, which would later disappear. But it's something that I find in these texts, that I certainly find in Horkheimer's text more clearly um, as something that I would, as someone who is constantly trying to uh, confront theory and praxis, who's, that's my, obsession, um, I, I find, at least in uh, Horkheimer's work, uh, someone who's doing that and one particular path. And the third thing is their particular praxis model, um, at least for Horkheimer, perhaps also for Adorno, which is a particular model that I personally would reject, but that is useful to me in rejecting. And that, and that is the idea that theory leads in some way to praxis, that, that's, that there's a directionality to it. Um, that's, that's a model of praxis which I, I don't agree with in the sense that um, I think more of a, of a constant confrontation which would enrich both theory and praxis rather than a direc directionality. Um, but I am thankful to these texts for uh, laying the groundwork uh, on which I could then build uh, a very different theory of uh, critique and praxis. Yeah. So, um, do you want to? Thank you. Yeah. 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 Very much. Uh, that was a lot. And um, if nobody would control me, I would need one hour to uh, to comment on what you said. Um, let. <laughs> it's it's my nature, by the way. Yeah. So, um, let me start with uh, what you said about the engagement with Marx, which is true, I think. Uh, in a very interesting way, both texts are in dialogue, I would say, with Marx, but in, in two very different ways. And I think the two ways are easily to describe. Uh, and this is even uh, backed up by a personal anecdote, which I would like to tell. I can't resist. Um, I think Horkheimer is much more into the young, young Marx. I mean, he is heavily influenced by the Paris manuscripts, which were edited, I don't know, shortly before. 
uh, he is engaged with the early Marx because he thinks there he finds already that kind of pragmatist view. I call it pragmatist. Uh, Horkheimer wouldn't call it pragmatist. But he thinks he finds there the view that theory is somewhat rooted in practical actions. And he takes it as being highly important for the right self-understanding of critical theory. So the differentiation uh, he is developing in this article, namely that sciences, be it the social sciences or the natural sciences, are rooted in some kind of work is taken, I think, from the early Marx. I mean, from the epistemology you find in the early Marx, especially in the Paris manuscripts, or what is called the Paris manuscripts. Um, and critical theory, he believes, this is almost also a Marxian idea of the early period. Critical theory has to be understood as the expression or the reflexive articulation of struggles already going on. I mean, Marx is using some metaphors for describing that. He is once saying that uh, theory has simply to play the melody of the ongoing conflicts and stuff like that. I think this is a view rooted in a careful reading, relatively careful, Marcuse was much better on this, of the young early Marx. I think Adorno is not interested in the young Marx at all. He is, if at all, interested in certain passages of the first volume of the Capital. And now comes the anecdote, because at the Institute for Social Research we have half of the library of Adorno located. Half of, I mean, a certain portion of the library was stolen and taken by the Nazis, the rest was taken by students uh, later. <laughs> but there, there, there is a, a good portion. It's better, yeah, probably. Uh, a good portion is still there. And what is still there are his editions of Marx. And that's not a lot. He has uh, two volumes that is something like the collective works of Marx, very bad edition. And he has the old mega edition of Capital First Volume. When you look in it, which you normally are not allowed, but because I was a director, I could take a look in it, <laughs> you see that he read exactly one chapter. He was completely disinterested in the economic stuff. I mean, accumulation process, uh, the Labor Day, and all this, not of huge interest. What he read, and you see thousands of little annotations, is the chapter on the commodity form. That reappears here. Yeah? I mean, the commodity form for him is something, I mean, deeply philosophical, um, because you can understand it as a kind of uh, figurative thinking or something like that. I, I will say something about this in a minute. So I think you're right. Both are engaged with Marx, but in a very different way. So I think um, I have a slightly different view on how Horkheimer understands reason in history. I mean, you are right. For him, the situation in his times, that is when you have uh, Nazi Germany and you have, on the other side, Stalinism. And he was fully aware of the totalitarianism totalitarianisms of both sides. You can't speak of any reason in history. But what he still believes, and I could give you a quote and I, I show you the passage, is that there is a kind of path in history, that's his notion, a path, which leads to slowly and not teleologically constrained or de teleologically determined that is expected to lead to the rational society. This path is interrupted in the present, but you have a view. I mean, if you, are, if you, are, if you take the right philosophical perspective, you can see that path. And this is, again, that's 
the young Marx. This is the young Marx um, appropriating Hegel, yeah? reason in history, but in this specific form. So I think he is much more optimistic about reason in history than Adorno, who does not longer believe that there is reason either in history or even in, in society. There is nothing like that. There might have been some reason in history until capitalism, I mean, speeded up, I think. That's Adorno's picture. So in, in the beginning of the negative dialectics, he's saying something about this. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, uh, the first one, Horkheimer, is still defending at that time uh, a philosophy of history, where Adorno never would have defended a philosophy of history. He, he is the, I mean, he, he is deeply convinced that something like a philosophy of history, which needs something like an idea about what drives history, is not possible. Uh, and therefore, I believe that the, that the dialectic of enlightenment is a strange book, because you can read it as a philosophy of history, but Adorno never would have defended, I think, a, a philosophy of history, even of the negative sort. Yeah? He, he wouldn't defend the idea that you can establish something like a philosophy of history. So uh, one word on Adorno's method. Um, I like the idea to bring it closer to what Clifford Goertz uh, called thick description. I don't believe it's true. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's tempting, but I think um, Adorno doesn't aim for a thick description. He is aiming for abstraction, to abstract from a lot of contingent features of the given situation in order to stress those elements of the given situation which are constitutive in order to understand it. Now I give you a quotation from Max Weber, yeah? a very interesting one, after a dialogue with Lukács. So Max Weber, being in conversation with Lukács, who was not his disciple directly, but who studied with him. So um, Max Weber is saying in this famous article on objectivity in the social sciences, he's saying one can delineate the ideal type of a capitalist culture that means one in which the governing principle is only the investment of private capital. This procedure would accentuate certain individual concretely diverse traits of modern material and intellectual culture in its unique aspects into an ideal construct, which from our point of view would be completely self-consistent. Consistent. This then would be the delineation of an idea of capitalist culture. I think, I always believed, that Adorno, who read more Weber than Marx, uh, I think got the idea of the figure, the construction of a figure, from Weber's idea of the construction of an ideal type. Because Weber, in describing that, is using the two notions. You have to start from empirical facts, you have to abstract certain of these facts in order to construct a certain picture of reality or figure of reality, and you have, and this is now interestingly Weber's notion, to invest fantasy, exact fantasy. This is repeated in words by Adorno. I mean, he speaks of exact fantasy. It needs exact fantasy in order to construe such figures. So what I believe is it's a method of abstraction. He likes the idea to start from empirical facts. He thinks one has to abstract from contingent facts, which are not relevant in so far as they don't inform us about the central features of the given reality. So you have to abstract from certain facts. You have to accentuate other facts. And the, then you have to construct a certain figure which suddenly allows you to understand what's going on. Commodity form. I think that 
I come now to the other point about praxis. And I mean, again, there are huge differences between Horkheimer and Adorno. Horkheimer, in his instrumentalist or functionalist or pragmatist view of theory, has to believe that all theory is rooted in praxis before it can influence praxis. Yeah? So Adorno never would, would uh, think of theory as having the power to create or to influence praxis as such. Sure, it can influence praxis, but it is, prior to this, rooted in practices. He asked himself what might be the praxis in which critical theory is rooted. As I wanted to show, he gives two answers to it. The more convincing definitely is when he's saying critical theory is rooted in critical, I think he's calling it critical behavior, in critical actions. I think what he means are struggles of the dominated groups against domination. And he thinks critical theory is rooted in such a praxis. It can influence then these praxis by making it more knowledgeable. For example, by adding knowledge to that already ongoing praxis. But it never can separate itself from the already ongoing praxis. I mean, it's almost a transcendental view of theory. He, he believes that critical theory is transcendentally rooted in an interest that is incorporated in struggles against domination. This is then later taken up by Habermas in Knowledge and Human Interest. I, think, I still think Habermas' best book. There he takes this up and gives it a different interpretation by using psychoanalysis as a model. But this is Horkheimer's view. I think Adorno's view is very different, and you mentioned that. And I think he believes here in the, what I called, the aesthetic power of such figures. I mean, there's this one sense, you mentioned that already, which is very interesting yeah, and astonishing. There he is saying that, I read it again, the interpretation of given reality and its abolition are connected to each other, not, of course, in the sense that reality is negated in the concept, that would be idealistic thinking, but that out of the construction of a configuration of reality, the demand for its real change always follows promptly. I think it means when you are capable of constructing the right kind of what's his uh, notion here, configurations of reality, the right kinds, then this prompts praxis in so far as um, the aesthetic power of the configuration is strong enough to motivate people to change reality. So, I mean, I give you an example which I always like. Cultural industry, I mentioned that already. If you suddenly understand that all our cultural institutions are organized in the form of capitalist industry, you feel, this is his idea, I think, you feel suddenly such a shame and at the same time a hate against the given situation that you are prompted to act against it, yeah? which means that you are promptly motivated to change the given situation. So I think this is the belief in the performative power or the aesthetic power in certain configural notions uh, or figures. So to present our given situation not simply as <coughs> neoliberalism or financial capitalism, but to come up with the right word, to describe what is going on, I mean this scandalous kind of financial capitalism. If you, if you have the talent, and if you have the aesthetic force to come up with the right figure, then you pros probably can prompt people to do something. But it needs, I mean, this is his notion and Weber's notion, exact fantasy. It needs imagination. It needs a kind of aesthetic power. 
to come up with such figures. And this is not an idea Horkheimer ever had. And I think this is an idea which is behind certain moves in the dialectic of enlightenment, as I said, because there you find certain figures or con configurations that are meant to portray the given situation in such a way that you can't resist to take it as the worst ever happened. So this is, I think, the method here. Mm -hmm. And so the, the relation between theory and practice is completely different because Adorno does not believe that philosophy is already rooted, or critical theory is already rooted in a kind of praxis. He, he doesn't share the pragmatist epistemology with Horkheimer or this kind of instrumentalism. Yeah? Um, so he believes that philosophy, like art, is meaningful in itself. It is not simply rooted in a kind of prior praxis or pre-theoretical uh, kind of practices, but it can motivate praxis or action, then it is able to develop aesthetically forceful configurations of the right kind. And I think he sometimes managed it, not always, and not always to the better. I think the whole idea of the administrative world is stuff like that, and I think it, it's not very convincing. Nobody is upset about our world when it, it is described as administered. But when it is, the, when our culture, uh, I mean, even what's going on in high art, in high culture, is described as cultural industry, that has a certain motivating effect. And in fact, by the way, in Germany it had an effect because it led to certain legal regulations of public broadcasting and private television. Yeah, it led to forbidding certain, uh, no, no, it, it led to the legal re regulation to force all radio broadcasting and all television bro um, stations to include at least 30% of information and high qualitative information in, in the production. So, and we still have this paragraph, which is uh, astonishing, but I think that is a result of this fantastic idea of describing the reality of our culture as cultural industry. To bring two words together with do not fit together, culture and industry. But to join them and to say, look, if you look carefully enough, this is industry, nothing else. Okay, so, yeah. Um, um, we'll, we'll leave open for you to come back the last provocation, which was, you know, how would you be using yeah. these texts? But we'll come back to that. Um, and um, on the last point, though, it's particularly interesting when to, to Can think of... Can I say one word? Yeah, sure. I think, uh, and this may, might come now as a surprise, I'm more, even if my heart is beating for Adorno, um, I think... I don't have the aesthetic imagination it uses to follow that method. And I don't know a lot of people. Probably Benjamin had that kind of aesthetic imagination to come up. But Benjamin was less su successful than Adorno with regard to this. So I'm, I think I follow Horkheimer in certain respects. And the text which you f can find on the internet is a documentation that I want to be this sounds very arrogant, and uh, you don't have to take me. Se you shouldn't take me seriously. I want to be the better Horkheimer. <laughs> I mean, less authoritarian than Horkheimer was, uh, a little bit more flexible, a little bit more open. But um, my heart is on Adorno's side. My mind is, or my, how you say, my spirit is on Horkheimer's side. Maybe, maybe your heart has softened to Adorno, though, then, because. Um, because in, in, the, in the critique of power, yeah. you were very critical of Adorno. I'm critical of both, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Well, you were critical of Horkheimer too, but more so of Adorno, I would say. But in a, okay, all right. And then the only, the only, the only when point. When I was writing that book, I wasn't aware of the possibility to read Adorno as somebody who differs deeply from Horkheimer in having his own method of interpretative philosophy. I still was believing that Adorno is the other part of Horkheimer, yeah? namely doing that kind of that kind of philosophy of history. I only changed my picture of Adorno later. And I became aware that you, uh, and this has a lot to do with reading that article again and again, the actuality of philosophy. I think we have to start to think of Adorno not in, in Horkheimerian terms, mm -hmm. but as completely independent, more influenced by Benjamin than by ever by Horkheimer, uh, less influenced by Lukács' grandiose philosophy of history, but deeply influenced by people like Georg Simmel, Walter Benjamin, the aesthetic tradition, and so on and yeah, so on. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree, I agree entirely um, about that. And then the only small footnote I would add, though, is I found fascinating the, the notion of a performative power. I would call it the performative power of naming, in a way, right. that, you were, that you were developing here. Um, but it's interesting, it's interesting still when you then read that, and when you reread the marginalia to theory and praxis, how there's, there's perhaps then not a self-consciousness, almost maybe in 68 there isn't a self-consciousness of that performative power of naming, because when he writes there that you know he had no practical intention when he wrote um, the Dialectic of Enlightenment or the Authoritarian Personality, where he says specifically no practical intention, and Marx had no practical intention uh, in his work, um, it's almost as if, well, if he did believe in the performativity uh, of naming, then um, there would be a practical intention. You know, I mean, because yeah. all that m all that work would be motivated in sense. I don't by forget, he, he wrote this articles in the period of the student movement, and he was extremely skeptical with regard to the revolutionary self understanding of the student movement. So he never wanted to. To, to be engaged in a kind of practice which uh, shared the wrong belief that it could change by revolution the existing conditions. He, n he never believed that in 68 or in 65. So he was deeply skeptical and he therefore resisted the idea that, there could, that his writings could be understood as wanting to initiate some kind of uh, student protest. I mean, he, he was too skeptical about it and, uh, and quite resignative at that time already, like Horkheimer too. They, they both became very resignative. Adorno, uh, Horkheimer by becoming more religious, going over to Schopenhauer, and Adorno by relying on himself more on aesthetics than on what can be called critical sociology or something like that. So. Okay, good. So let's open it up and let me um, get the mic out. Um, Joe, are, are you picking up from the blue or from, there's a mic on the table. Use the, use the handheld? Okay. okay. Uh, so, who wants to uh, start? Sure. Hi, I'm uh, Dylan Bannis, um, a first year PhD student with the history department. I do German intellectual history. Um, I wanted to, I, I was really interested uh, with this discussion. And what I, I, I found a little bit interesting was um, in examining Adorno, I was sort of mulling over uh, sort of how it's translated between the, the, the German title is very similar to the English title. Uh, in that it's um, actualität instead of actuality. But uh, actualität has a different meaning from my understanding. And so I feel like the English title almost tries to make it seem like it's about philosophy as becoming 
rather than an article on the relevance of philosophy. Um. Okay. Let's take uh, two more. Ross, one more. Thank you. Um, I found this conversation enormously productive and helpful, and it, it made me want to revisit that section which you both alluded to on page 131 about exact fantasy. Um, I mean, uh, Axel, I, I think I would slightly disagree with the understanding of, of Weber's use of that term to calibrate, essentially, the distance between the... Sorry. Uh, so it's page 36 okay. for you. Okay, page for, for Weber, that sort of calibrating the distance between the uh, ideal type and the phenomenal actuality, whereas it seems in this passage that for Adorno it really has to do with the question of arrangement. And um, I mean, it's a remarkable, remarkable passage there, an exact fantasy which abides strictly within the material which the sciences present to it and reaches beyond them only in the smallest aspects of their arrangements, aspects granted which fantasy itself must originally generate. Um, I mean, this strikes me as a kind of model of pedagogy. And so it's interesting that ratio here is really reduced to the question of examining and testing. It's not rationality, it's not rationalization, it's not the, definitely not totalization in any, in any way. And I just wanted to, to ask you to think aloud with us or help me understand better a notion of practice here which is not simply the automaticity of you give a different constellation and automatically people will feel motivated impelled to move, but whether the practice of testing, examining and testing, is indeed the source of that constellative rethinking, that rearrangement of um, what he says, elements in question. Uh, we have a colleague who speaks a great deal about pedagogy as the non-coercive rearrangement of desires, um, and that affinity and difference is interesting, but I mean, is, is, is that practice, that uh, uh, experimenting and testing, examining and testing that constellation, the practice. I mean, it's uh, not revolutionary practice, but uh, it's not it's not following. It's not merely the outcome of the constellation. It is the generation of the constellation. Nadia, Urbinetti. Yeah, I'd like to ask you a question that seems to be a blasphemy kind of question, meaning. This idea of uh, the narrative or the configuration capable of striking our imaginations and then to make us act consistently in relation to that. This is reminiscent of a long, uh, terrifying tradition in the 20th century, Sorel, and this idea of the myth capable of striking the imaginations of masses following a goal without even understanding, but the understanding is in their action, even if they don't rationalize. How much these uh, permanent and terrifying, uh, somehow, image of imagination strike, str strike in this way uh, was present in Adorno in that case? All right, why don't we, why don't we start there? Yeah, um, so I start with Nadia's question. Um, I, I think, I think that what you are mentioning is true especially for Walter Benjamin. Benjamin was heavily influenced by Sorel. I mean, he has read Sorel. He, then I co remember correctly, even tried to to come in contact with Sorel. They overlapped for certain years. Um, so he was fascinated by the idea of constructing myths. And he was using it when he later <coughs> developed the idea of historic, I, I, I don't know the English translation for it. The German word is historische Bilder. Yeah? Historical picture is not the right word, uh, figures, what? Images. images, historical images, I think that's the translation, yeah. So I think 
I don't know, I mean, and then you have, and you have that in Benjamin clearly, then you have the idea that those images can move a whole group or mass. I think in the case of Adorno, he, he has a much more individualized understanding of it. It's not the mass, it's not the group, but it is the individual single human subject, which might conclude from reading such names or, I mean, being confronted with such figures, might conclude for him or herself to go over to Praxis. He never trusted the masses, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I, I think the logic, the logic works for uh, Benjamin, clearly. And you see all these Sorelian elements in the middle of Benjamin, I think. But in Adorno, this is absent. Because he has already in mind the, the aesthetic model of understanding an artwork. And this is something you do individually. He never liked the idea that the, the, the Benjaminian idea that it is the mass in the cinema, in the movie theater, which can be moved uh, as, which can be moved to a kind of revolt. He had in view the individual listener in a concert, the individual observer or visitor of an art exhibition, so always the individual. So I think he's away from this. I mean, with regard to, to your question, I don't know whether, I mean, I still would defend the comparison to Weber. Um, and the, b because, I mean, it is an activity, sure, yeah? To construct such figures is a kind of philosophical activity he would say an interpretative activity of a specific kind. It's not simply the activity we are already applying when we try to understand another person or when we try to understand a foreigner from a strange culture. These are attempts of understanding he has not in mind. But these are also activities, yeah? The activities of trying to understand the meaning of utterances. He thinks there are not such utterances because there is no intention behind the text of reality. No intention. We could understand the text as a meaningful entity if there would be some kind of intention behind it. But because there is no intention behind it, we can't take the text as a normal text like this book. This book is an intentional text. I mean, the author wants to say something. Uh, the capitalist culture or the capitalist economy is not a text in that sense. He, he describes it as a text, but is a, is, it is a text of a different character because it's a text without a meaning. I think his his usage of the notion riddle is meant to indicate this. That social <coughs> pieces of social reality or certain social reality is a riddle means that it would be in vain to search for an intention behind it, a meaning in that sense. So we have to come up with another form of interpretation, a more active one, a more constructive one. I don't know whether I would use notions like examining, probably, examining reality. Huh? Yeah, I know, I know, but still, I, sure, I mean, yeah, how, how can I describe how I understand it? You, you, you have to make selections from the given reality. You have to make heavy selections because there is too many brutal facts. <laughs> So how do you make these, these selections? You have a certain interest in coming up with figures, or constellative figures, that allow you to understand this reality better, understanding now in this non-hermeneutical sense. Yeah? 
So how, how you are treating the reality? You, I mean the Marx example, yeah? He thinks Marx was able to concentrate on certain elements of this capitalist economy, to abstract from other, many other details in which Marx wasn't interested at the moment in which he came up with the idea of the commodity form. He reduced the whole reality to one specific element of it. I mean, one abstract element, which is meant to, to, to present all the constitutive elements of that reality. And so, yeah, you have to test realities as long as you suddenly realize how to construct it best. It's an, it's, 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 it's an activity of our cognition or imagination. Of our ima imagination is the word he's using or exact fantasy, yeah? But again, this is exactly the notion Weber is using. Weber is saying it needs, Weber is even using the notion exact fantasy. It needs exact, exact fantasy because it operates on facts. Yeah, it's not simple aesthetic imagination because you start from given facts, from social reality as it is given in form of certain empirical facts. You operate on these facts and you invest in exact fantasy, yeah, I mean testing and experimenting plays a role, yeah, because you try as long on that material, you try till that moment in which you suddenly, yeah, it's like an, like an, how you say, like, like, a yeah, like a spark, I mean, like the central intuition you have. Suddenly you have it. And um, he's using in one sense here the notion of Gestalt. I think that also plays a role, yeah? It, ne it needs a certain sensitivity for the Gestalten of reality. Uh, and you have to try as long as you have it in view. I don't see the connection to pedagogy, but I may, may have a very limited understanding of what pedagogy is. That was about, yeah, actuality. I don't know exactly what, he, I mean, sure, I think in, in, in what you wanted to say is the, actu the, what was your, the, the, yeah. well, the this is also sort of, this is also sort of in the context of 1931 Germany, yeah. right, um, Heidegger is sort of uh, reigning supreme at this point, and he's trying to say, no, he's trying to divorce us from uh, sort of the purpose of philosophy. So that's why I, I, I feel like um, sometimes with these translations, words are chosen that I, I think make co text more complicated than they really need to be. And my impression from this text was um, more of leaning towards a relevance of philosophy than say, uh, sort of a material becoming a philosophy that uh, actuality seems to But, but what you have in actuality and Adorno definitely wanted to have is this moment of history, or I mean this time, the, the, the importance of philosophy, the how to understand philosophy in exactly the moment in which I am writing this text. And this means a moment that is already characterized by all the consequences of the uh, destruction of reason in social reality. So the moment in which I'm writing this text is characterized by the absence of that kind of reason that some philosophers are still searching for or others have completely given up to search for and replaced it by the force of irrationality. This is, in his view, the philosophy of life. Yeah? It's Bergson in the background, but he always liked Bergson to a certain degree. It is mainly Heidegger whom he takes, I think, wrongly for a vitalist or philosophy of life. 
So you have these two wrong understandings of philosophy. You have Husserl still searching for rationality within, res within, uh, uh, within reality by his transcendental kind of idealism. And on the other side, you have this irrationalist, which are also believing that there is some force behind everything, some driving force namely the elan vital in, in the case of Bergson or the, the drive for death in Heidegger. Uh, nothing of that is true. What we are confronted with is an ununderstandable text. No force behind it. No visible force. And the actuality refers to that, I thought. Yeah? But and I don't know how the English sounds when you use the English notion actuality. It sounds like important, yeah? Relevant. Yeah? Well, it, does, it, does capture, it does capture the important element of the temporal dimension yeah. of, it's, it's a temporal yeah, dimension it's today, it's given that we have gone beyond right. the, the period of totality right. uh, in philosophy. Um, I just wanted to come back to, w to, the, to the fantasy, the ideal type, and because what's so important here, I think, is the size is the space that this category takes. Um, and you see it clearly, so on page 35, at the bottom of, okay, sorry, on, the, on 130, 130 in the telos, and the bottom of 35 uh, in the um, Blackwell, where he, the, the point of interpretive philosophy is to construct keys before which reality springs open. You had mentioned that part, right? As to the size of the key categories, they are specially made to order, right? The old idealism chose categories too large, so they could not even come close to fitting the keyhole. Um, philosophic so sociologism chooses them too small, right? And then he talks about class, and the category of class being the right level, he suggests, that the sociologists are nullifying the the, the performative effect of the category of class because they have countless descriptions of separate groups and that doesn't do the work, right? And so they're at some level too small. And so, and so here, so, you know, so what is the, fan the fantasy works nicely in that sense because it can kind of change size in some way, I suppose. Ideal, I mean, the, qu the question becomes, what size is the ideal type? How is it that the ideal type fits next to other ideal types in, a, the, in the relationship of ideal types? If, for instance, we have you know, traditional or charismatic or ideal types like that, right? They are, in some sense, alternate. Al they, they fit next to each other. There are three ideal types of there, maybe. And here, um, here there isn't that element. Right? There's an element of something like class, but of course the problem with class as the proper size is that, well, with Marx it's a pretty big size, right? Uh, line, like, you know, the history of all, what is, how, do, how do we start, you know, the history is class conflict, right? So, I mean, it covers a lot. Um, but, but somehow I'm still, I still yeah. think that the level, it's kind of like I was suggesting this middle level somehow, yeah because we know what's too big and we know what's too small, but then this thing fits there. Um, but it does have something to do with coming up with a, the power of the category in some sense is related to its um, copiousness in covering facticity somehow. Yeah, but the example Weber is giving himself, capitalist culture, is rather big. Mm. Right. It's, it's meant to cover the whole reality of existing capitalism. And I think, I mean, the, the I'm, I'm sure that Weber has some other methodological ideas in view when he's using his notion of ideal type, others than Adorno. I don't want to say they are sharing exactly the same concept. Weber believed that the ideal type helps us. I mean, I want to stress the fact that the ideal type in Weber's sense is the result of the combination of the usage of exact fantasy and knowledge of facts. This is 
very often repeated in Adorno's text. So this is similar. For Weber, the ideal type has a methodological purpose, namely to make visible what he calls potential possibilities or objective possibilities of reality. This is not simple reality. It's not a mirror of reality when you speak of a capitalist culture because the culture is not completely capitalistic. You have many, many other elements. But when you are using the notion or the figure of capitalist culture, you make clear, you want to make clear, that this is an objective possibility within the existing culture. Yeah? And I think this is true for commodity <coughs> form too, because it would be completely wrong to believe that all our interactions, all our uh, behavior in uh, the capitalist society Marx had in view <coughs> are dictated by the commodity form. No, you have very different and other forms of comportment and of behavior, but it indicates the objective possibility that everything can become the result of that commodity form. <coughs> so I thought this is also a linkage between Weber and, and Adorno, even when Weber is not mentioning the methodological idea of objective possibility, which plays a big role for Weber. All right, so I've got four, uh, four next questions, and then um, we'll come back to you. We're going to start with uh, Frank Hong, and okay. then we're going to have Camila Vergara, Etienne Balibar, and Reinhold Martin. So, Frank. Okay, uh, maybe we can continue the metaphor of size of the key. Uh, here's my attempt. Uh, within the last 48 to 72 hours, uh, the leader of the free world in this town, in the forum of UN, uh, declared to the effect that uh, the future n does not belong to globalists, it belongs to nationalist uh, pat patriots. Is that s some category of the right side for current generation uh, to try to solve as a riddle? Is that something qualified as a riddle for this generation as a critical thinking? Uh, I'm not really asking this question, I'm asking this rhetorically. Because uh, that opened up to debate not fitting to this class. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, as I read your article, uh, the, is there in Panthetry uh, Interest 2014 article, uh, you used Harvey Moss as point of departure, and you have the line to the effect, denaturalization of hegemonic interpretation of norms. Uh, there are s different ways of saying the same thing. And also I noticed your 1993 article, uh, the conception of civil society, uh, where toward the end of that article, you quickly alluded to uh, Gramsci, Anthony Gramsci's concept. And he, he, to my knowledge, used the concept of hegemony a lot. Uh, I was somewhat surprised in your 2014 article, you seem did not mention uh, him and not, did not really cite his uh, points. Uh, I wonder, is that just because the space of limitation of your writing or for some other reason within 20 years you find his theory is kind of outdated or uh, otherwise not worthy? So that was my question. Thank you, Frank. Camilla. Thank you. Uh, so I want to question you on the kind of normative uh, understanding difference between these two approaches to critical theory. Um, so as I understood Horkheimer, um, he, critical theory for him starts from a protest against the system, in a way, of the rules that exist. Uh, a protest that is generated by the uh, order itself. So it's a kind of response that is also rooted in the idea of self-determination. Um, and in that distrust, he says that it's based on the distrust for the rules of conduct. And, but even then he says that the, the position of the critical theorist or the position of the subaltern uh, outside does not assure the correctness of knowledge because of hierarchy and other things that are happening. Uh, so there's not really a correct critical theory. It's just a position as I understand it. Um, uh, but for Adorno, as I understood your analysis of him, is the, that the correct words or the correct critical theory is the one that demands this uh, uh, praxis that comes out of it. So in a way, is the, the, um, it is the result or the response that is uh, demanded that actually gives the kind of the normative element of what is critical theory. Um, so 
it's only this capacity for change, is the first question, that uh, would allow us, uh, allow us to understand what is critical theory and what is not critical theory. So in a way, the correct keyhole is connected to the result, to our further understanding of and our demanding of praxis. Uh, or, or, and and is, this is connected to the other question that I have, which is uh, if Adorno is more uh, on the side of abstracting, so is the abstraction, the correct abstraction that, would, that determines what critical theory is, uh, what is the danger of abstracting for, from material conditions in order to determine what critical theory is? So there was a book last year about Plato as a critical theorist, and this idea that anybody could be a critical theorist, and basically this is the abstraction from the material conditions that would kind of de uh, undermine critical theory, at least as Horkheimer would understand it. So what are the dangers of this abstraction, even if it's useful? Thank you. Etienne Baliba. Actually, I reply to that. Because my question is on a very different point. But, uh, okay, okay, so maybe why don't we take those two I don't want and to, then, and then to abuse. And, and Reinhold. Yeah. Do you want to well, address? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Yeah, I mean, only very shortly to um, the point on Trump. I mean, I mean, if there is any intention behind it, if we are optimistic enough to believe that Trump has rational intentions, then his usage of the notion patriotism, he used patriotism and not nationalism, I think, is intended I mean, it's clever because patriotism is positively co associated. Yeah, it has, it re I mean, it allows one uh, to have positive associations which you don't have automatically with nationalism. So it would have been a clever move, but uh, it's more the Sorelian, Sorelian idea of constructing the myth of a patriotic USA or something like that, being independent from all, r all the rest of the world and so on and so on. It wouldn't have to do anything with Adorno's construction. And about Gramsci, this is a too big question, I have to say. I mean, it's not that I intentionally avoided to come back to Gramsci. I think I had at a certain point the impression that I do not understand him sufficiently, mainly because not being able to read the original. I mean, there is, in the meantime, a German translation of the prison, bo prison how do you call it, prison notice, notes, which I, which I didn't read because lack of time, probably, <laughs> but no <laughs> systematic reason. Um, yeah, this question is also very big because it leads to the very problematic uh, question at the end, namely where, whether there is at all an identity in what we are used to call critical theory, or to, to make it more precise, the Frankfurt School. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are many critical theories around in the world, and they all have their possibly their legitimacy. Uh, most of them are worthwhile endeavors to come up with methodolog methodologies to criticize the existing social order. Only one of these many, many approaches is called critical theory with a big C, or the Frankfurt School. And if you realize how huge the differences are between Horkheim and Adorno, you start to think about whether the whole idea that there is a unified approach which deserves it to be called a school or the critical theory, uh, that this whole idea becomes doubtful. And I never know exactly how to deal with this. I mean, and how to... I, there was a time in which I believed, and I still have somewhat the idea, that 
the specific identity of the critical theory which was for a certain period based in Frankfurt is its left Hegelianism. And I think it's true for most of the participants. It's true for Horkheimer, it's true for Habermas, uh, it's probably true for Adorno, but I have more reservations uh, with regard to Adorno than with regard to the others. The, the central figures like Adorno, Marcuse, and Habermas, they share the idea of what I sometimes called a pathology of reason, that capitalism has led to a pathology of what reason is meant to be. This is a deeply Hegelian idea, namely that there is a history of reason and that we can spell out by under specific capitalist conditions our capacity for reasoning and for progression by using our reason why this capacity is somewhat violated or disturbed under capitalist conditions. I thought that's the central idea. So the central idea would have to do with a certain left Hegelian uh, appropriation of Hegel, the materialistic reading of Hegel, mm -hmm. and then the ambition to spell out why capitalist why the structures of capitalist societies are such that it leads to an inhibition of our capacity for reasoning. Namely, for example, to reduction of all reasoning to instrumental reason. Or Habermas sometimes called it strategic reason. And also for him, this has to do with requirements of capitalist economy. Yeah? The, the requirements of a capitalist economy and therefore a capitalist society require from us or force us to make use only of one of the elements of our capacity for reason or reasoning, namely the instrumentalistic side. So it's uh, this kind of idea of which I thought it unifies the critical theory of the Frankfurt School. And I still believe it. I'm a little bit more doubtful with regard to, to Adorno. I mean, if, if you, especially when you read this article, you, you realize that he, I mean, he, he, I don't know whether he feels at home in that kind of company. Because he, from the beginning, was much more interested in coming up with aesthetic methods. Mm -hmm. He was more influenced probably by Schelling in that regard than by Hegel. A certain aesthetic, I mean the, the, the aesthetic as being the leading kind of discipline. And therefore I have doubts whether one can easily include uh, Adorno. On the other side he also shares the idea that critical theory, I mean, critical theory should be able to, to understand the riddle of capitalism. And the riddle of capitalism has something to do also for him with a certain destruction of reason. I mean, not, not in the Lukacian sense, yeah? I mean, in, in Lukacs' later strange book, uh, on, on I, I don't know the English title for it, Zerstörung, Destruction of Reason. But that capitalism can't be understood sufficiently without describing what it does with our, I mean, cap our, our capacities for reasoning, for reason. Uh, this is shared by Adorno, but I don't know whether he shares all the rest. Yeah? So I have certain doubts there. Let me, I just want to add something to that, though, because, I mean, the, the reading you're giving, I think, is highly influenced by your Hegelianism. Yeah. 
um, and by that of some others, maybe Rahel Yagi, Yagi. Um, but I mean, in terms of in terms of these texts, I feel more. I feel Marx is a greater presence in but these I texts than. It, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. And then, uh, yeah, young, yeah, 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 okay, all right, um, <laughs> yeah, and, and then, to, uh, and then, and let me just add two things, I would say also that within the later work, um, there's more of a gravitation, I would say, I mean, in others, in some others, towards a certain, certain Kantianism than uh, Hege Hegelianism, uh, certainly in the work of uh, Reiner Forst, say, um, and then the other thing I would observe also in terms of these is that uh, from, uh, from my own personal and from anecdotal, you know, this is not a scientific study, but I think that I would say that much more doctoral work today is being done, say, but maybe that's my, maybe that's my bias or my, you know, what I see on the relationship between, say, Foucault and Adorno, right, then between Horkheimer and Adorno, right? And so there's some kind of splitting that seems to be going on in the um, contemporary kind of theoretical kind of matrices that are being placed over some of these thinkers, right? Um, okay, Etienne and then uh, Reinhold. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, well. yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I need not to be too long, and I want to explain myself. So I leave aside entirely the Horkheimer side, although there is something very interesting in uh, Horkheimer around the definition of science as problem solving, which I would like to discuss in another. I want to concentrate on Adorno. Yeah. Let me start again with your remarks on the cultural industry. Uh, that was very striking, huh? because I hope I'm not uh, distorting, I'm not simplifying, but what you said essentially is there's something utterly unbearable, it's scandalous, in the combination of these two va notions which refer to antithetic values. Industry, especially capitalist industry, of course, but every industry today, today is capitalist, and culture. Huh? So when it is described as such and displayed in a, in, a, in a theory or in a theoretical discourse, we feel that anger, that despair, that hate, you said hate, huh? and therefore we react against it. Too late, my dear friend. This is no longer the case. This is the case for a handful of people who are almost all in this room tonight. You know, but not even, not, even, not even all academics, intellectuals in the broad sense, feel anger and hate and despair at the idea that culture is an industry that has to be rationally organized and managed to be productive, effective, uh, rewarding, etc., etc. On the contrary, this is extremely appealing. Now, of course, in the younger generation, and I see that with my grandsons, for example, some feel despair. Uh, but this is, they are so despaired that they move to extreme anarchism and to the, the idea that, in fact, this society is just to be destroyed. The, 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 uh, the, the coming insurrection or something like that. Uh, but we're no longer in the mood of uh, Adorno, which is still yours and mine, in, 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 in a sense. Uh, so this is a riddle. Uh, and this is a riddle in the present, and something that calls for an Adornian uh, 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 method of interpretation, which takes me, if you allow me one more minute, to, to my uh, point concerning the text. I was struck by the fact, and please, please, don't believe I'm trying to uh, push you uh, in a nasty manner, etc., but by the fact that you did not com comment on something that I believe is central in the text, which is not the reference to Marx when it comes to the riddle, Rätsel, uh, but which is the reference to Freud. Uh, and so, of course, riddle is a Marxian category. Uh, and it is directly linked to the uh, uh, privilege that Adorno, as you explained, uh, etc., his library and, uh, and all that, and we knew that, of course, granted to the first section of Capital Volume 1, uh, where Marx, 
repeats again and again that there is something rätselhaft, etwas rätselhaftes in der Ware uh, or, the, or the in the Warenproduktion. Produ in the production of commodities, there is something enigmatic, something of a riddle, fetishism, blah, blah, blah which has to be uh, uh, solved. Okay, this is true. But when in the middle of his text, for, uh, uh, Adorno comes to trying to better explain more uh, uh, directly, more pract pragmatically, I would say, what a materialist attitude, a materialist kind of interpretation would be, then he comes to Freud. And of course, this makes a lot of sense biographically because this is his inaugural lecture, and before that he had written his habilitation, and the habilitation was on Freud, and so on and so on. But what I find extremely interesting is I return to the German text because the, uh, the, 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 the English translation is catastrophic here. The English translation says what is interesting in Freud's method is that he wants to interpret totalities or complex, etc., uh, uh, taking as his point of observation and departure the smallest elements, uh, something small, a detail, uh, which seems to be an allusion to an old tradition in natural history or biology, etc., where you explain what the structure of the big animal is just by uh, 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 looking at the form of a small finger or a, a bone, etc., etc. The German doesn't say that. Uh, it says, wenn wahrhaft Deutung allein durch Zusammenstellung des kleinsten gerät, des kleinsten. Uh, so this is of course typically idiomatically German. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a category, the, the small, the smallest, the smallest as such. And uh, in a context where you talk about Freud, the name of that smallest is not difficult to find. It's the symptom, uh, it's the symptom. So the riddle is immediately identified with the symptom in the psychoanalytic sense, and the key to the materialist attitude is related to the interpretation of symptoms. Now I jump to the conclusion, of course. The interpretation of symptoms in the psychoanalytic uh, uh, um, co context uh, is a clinical operation. Uh, it's not just uh, an observation, uh, an explanation that uh, objectively or uh, that keeps the distinction between the subject and the object. It destroys the distinction between the subject and the, and, and, and the object. Therefore, it has an active dimension. Uh, and so that gives me the idea that, in fact, Adorno in this text is looking for some sort of uh, overcoming, I would say, of the subject-object uh, 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 distinction, of the kind of objectivity, uh, etc., and looking for a materialism that includes an element of intervention, or if you like, an element of activity in its consideration of, acti of, of actuality. Uh, now, what you said replying to the question was absolutely accurate, but there is something uh, uh, also very symptomatic there. I looked for repetitions of this name actualité or actu actuality in the text. There is none. Uh, it's only in the title. Yeah. Uh, it's only in the title. But then, of course, Adorno continuously works with approximations, I would say. So it starts with Wirklichkeit, and of course in a Hegelian or post-Hegelian context, Wirklichkeit includes already an element of activity, it's not Realität itself. It's not Wirksamkeit, uh, it's not Aktivität, uh, but then of course you have the Aktuellen Aufgaben, and then, and then you have the Produktivität der Philosophie. So I think that, I don't know, doesn't, I don't want to s him to say what he doesn't say, but at the limit, uh, at the edge of his, uh, of his speech, there emerges, in fact, very strongly, if you read it twice, in a symptomatic uh, uh, manner, this question about the uh, materialist uh, uh, um, uh, attitude that would combine, that would combine, of course, objectivity and intervention or uh, a, a, a clinical uh, uh, element. And then, of course, everything is open. You can take that in the direction of Foucault. Of course. Foucault's uh, uh, well-known uh, 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 texts uh, uh, on enlightenment, uh, etc., are entirely about that, the ontologie de, de l'actualité, etc. Uh, 
around this concept of, actu of, of actuality. And, and the Freudian uh, uh, orientation or the quasi-Freudian orientation is the one at, that, as you say, always favored. So I find Adorno here amazingly close to Althusser's uh, 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 problem. I, I'm sorry if I was a little long, but I uh, wanted to challenge you on that. <laughs> Merci. Um, one, let's take one more. One more. Let's see if we can get in one more. I do actually want to hear the response to uh, Etienne's question. I'll just try to complement this in uh, briefly. Uh, it, my question is actually to really to both Bernard and Axel uh, and returns a little bit to the toolkit problem from the last time around that you mentioned at the beginning. Because it seems to me, and, and this it may in fact be in some sense inversely complementary to uh, uh, Etienne's question about riddles, uh, that, that, that the, the central figure in, in this text, it seems to me, are the two subjects. One is the riddle, the other is the key. And, um, and the key. The key, uh, the, the riddle, the, 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 as, as you said. And, and so, you know, I, I want to ask if we can, on the one hand, um, think dialectically with this pair, Horkheimer, Adorno, as ideal types in their own way, uh, of two different sides of, of the problem that we're discussing of idealism and materialism. Because, on the, because at some level, a key is just a key to speak with Freud. And, and th there are just like things in the world, actual things called keys, out of which, like automobiles, bombs, and movies in the culture industry chapter, out of which a figure, a constellation in a la Benjamin, you know, is constructed with, in, through this kind of imaginative act that, that Ross also, I think, rightly alluded to as a potentially pedagogical one. So the question is how to read the key. I mean, how to teach ourselves to learn how we might read these figures uh, in the world today, uh, and especially in res response to the toolkit question, because what is it? It's an instrument, right? And, and so I, I think in some sense, this, a, a generous reading of this could, could be, first of all, to read Adorno as instrumental, but, but simultaneously to, uh, you know, to the, the function of philosophy is to unlock the door. Uh, not to provide the idealist blueprint or to do the cat burglary of sociology, um, but, but simultaneously to, 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 to think twice about what we mean by instrumentalization. Uh, and this would be, if I take your characterization, Adorno's critique of Horkheimer in some sense, that the, you know, this kind of telos of instrumental rationality and so on is a bit, you know, a bit much uh, ultimately and, and isn't in it in some sense a little bit more dialectical. Uh, so, so the, because it does, it, on the aesthetical philosophical side of this equation that I'm really wanting to ask about, I did want to ask whether Bernard's earlier call for toolkit thinking or, or instrumental thinking in the sense I think you're trying to get at uh, could be recovered, uh, but in an Adornian fashion, you know, with keys, not necessarily hammers, for example. Thanks, Reinhold. Yeah. Um, thank you. D d d a small remark before I even start to answer the questions. Um, because you said Adorno's critic of Horkheimer. Adorno never criticized Horkheimer. Not one sentence you can find, which is scandalous, I think. But uh, <laughs> no, he even accepted. Horkheimer, uh, that's a famous story. I mean, Horkheimer rejected the habilitation of Habermas because Horkheimer believed this is too Marxist. Adorno was against this, but never mentioned anything to Horkheimer to change his mind. So he was somewhat, uh, sub you say, submissive to, to Horkheimer <coughs> in, a, yeah, docile, in, a, in a very strange sense. Uh, so he never would have criticized him. But this is not a systematic answer to anything. Um, I mean, first, the, the remarks about cultural industry. The cultural industry. I think it simply means that those figures, constellations, or however you want to call them, have their history. Yeah. Their history. I mean, they, they and Adorno, would be completely aware of it, yeah? These, the intervention or the 
the, the production of such keys able to open the door, I mean, to the riddle, yeah? to, to, to solve the riddle, um, they can die out as soon as reality has changed. And what we realize now is that culture industry is so, I mean, so total that the notion probably doesn't make any sense more because we don't have a lot of alternatives. Yeah, I mean, in his time, when he was writing that, there, I think he believed there is still high culture. High culture not completely uh, destroyed by the industrial organization of it. No, in his time, yeah. And now we are living in a, in a completely different time. So, it, I mean, to answer your question with Adorno, one would have to say, look, then we have to come up with new keys, with new figures to describe the new reality. Um, one more remark to that remark by you. I'm not completely sure whether I share the empirical observation that people do accept that kind of industrialized culture. I'm, I'm not sure about it. I mean, yeah, yeah, but you know, you know, there is this famous, famous little research done by Adorno on how people are, are looking television. Yeah? Uh, it's not very well known, but he normally has this idea television is the most awful thing because it manipulates people. Yeah? They're sitting in front of it, they believe what they are told, and they are completely manipulated. So there is this one little research project, uh, project that he once performed in the Institute for Social Research, and there is a passage where he's saying, for the first time I realize that people probably are not even looking. Are not even looking to it. Instead, they are using it as an opportunity for very interesting conversations. They are not manipulated by this. So I don't know what's going on. Yeah? Uh, I think it's a very difficult question what's going on. And sometimes I'm hopeful enough to believe that when people are seeing certain movies or, I don't know, television productions, they simply don't believe the shit. And you know, that that I, I'm pushing to the, to the extreme. Yeah. Because each time we have a discussion about any subject, I come up with the same idea, which is that we neglect ambivalence. You know? Yeah, but in this case, I respect <laughs> ambivalence. Yeah. Um, I found your remarks on Freud extremely interesting. Yeah, And I think you are completely right. I think there is a lot of the techniques of Freud in that text, yeah? And it is one more element to help to understand what he means with constructing a figure, yeah? And I think it's also right to say that riddle could also be equated with what in, in, in the context of Freud is called symptoms, yeah? Symptoms are something we don't understand in the beginning. And symptoms, symptoms also share with what he calls riddle the fact that they don't have intention as their source. I mean, they are not intended. In that sense, they are not, they don't have intentional meaning, which you simply can understand with the classical instruments of hermeneutics. This is all true. Um, I, I still believe, and I, I don't know whether we share that or not, that the psychoanalytic technique of the therapist trying to solve that riddle, trying to understand a symptom, is a specific form of hermeneutic. A specific, not the traditional form of hermeneutics, but it is an, an endeavor to understand something, something which is not understandable. Where did you 
I know, I know, I know. Yeah, 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 I know. So here I'm more on the side of those which would say Freud is using a kind of their different notions for that. Some are saying deep interpretation. I don't like that notion. Some people would say objective hermeneutics. I like that notion, I have to say. It's not subjective hermeneutics. It's not trying to understand the intention, yeah? subjective intention. It is to understand the objective meaning of a text. So the objective meaning of the symptom. And the objective meaning of the symptom means the place of a symptom in a history of Yeah. of uh, religious or Schopenhauerian or whatever. Uh, uh, at the end of the text, there are, really, there are references to the, the forms in which psycho psychoanalysis is used by uh, Klages and others who transform it into precisely a technique of mythical, etc. Yeah. This is not the material yeah, side. Yeah, yeah. I think we agree on almost everything here. Um, and I try to figure out where we don't agree, because we normally don't agree. And it would, be <laughs> it would be too surprising that we would agree on something. Uh, I think it's simply, I, I, I have a, diff a slightly different understanding of the Freudian technique. I think that's the whole point. And that also then means that I have difficulties to see, but that will not surprise you, why Adorno and Althusser can be even named in one and the same sentence. Yeah, I, I, I don't see that. But I have probably a different, I mean, you are closer to Althusser and you have certainly the better understanding of Althusser. But to all of my understanding, these are two very different strategies of analyzing capitalism. Yeah? Uh, the hermeneut, I mean, the, the quasi hermeneutical method. Adorno is privileging here. And again, I agree, it's a kind of psychoanalytic understanding of a text that has no intentional meaning, and in that sense has to be taken as a symptom, I agree. But this is still a kind of hermeneutical enterprise. Whereas Althusser, to my little reading, I would say preferred a certain type of specific, interesting explanation, not understanding, if that makes sense to you, this distinction. Well, fortunately on that, we'll, we'll, we'll be back here on November 13th with uh, Etienne Bédibar on Althusser. So we'll have an opportunity to revisit this. But I think we should also address the question of the keys. I mean, and one thing that I was particularly focusing is on the, the verbs that are used in these passages that... Uh, I, I know, I know, I was going to be cautious about this. Etienne, you might want to double check the, Etienne, you might want to double check the German on this, but um, the passage on constructing, so the, the point of interpretive philosophy is to construct keys, um, which is one, two, three, four, five, it's kind of six paragraphs from the end. I don't know if you'll be able to find it. It's on the bottom of 130, six paragraphs from the end bottom of 130 or bottom of, of about 35, 36 in your, um, uh, right? Is this, so there's this notion of, const at least in the translation, constructing keys. But what's interesting is that in the other sentence, pure philosophical socialism chooses them too small, right? Which is, so it's choosing. So it's a very different relationship to the object because it's almost as if the object is there and not being constructed, but being picked up in a way. And there's, another, and there's another reference to a uh, number of sociologists who carry uh, nominalism too far, right? So I think 
um, we would need to know, um, I think that there's a little bit of, I mean, depending on the German original, uh, there, the, the English tr translation suggests a little bit of um, inexactitude in the metaphor. Because I think the constructing the keys is an important one that is different than the toolbox, which was the point I was trying to make last time, which is that we don't find the tools in the toolbox, but we are in the process of constructing them, right? Um, yeah. Well, so, I mean, there's some ambiguity to that, right? There's some ambiguity. Um, I would prefer the idea of constructing keys, personally or at least in my readings, right? Uh, tu, tu veux prendre le micro? Tiens. Vas-y. Si c'est en uh, uh, Feuerbach, uh, number 11, Schlüssel zu konstruieren, vor denen die Wirklichkeit aufspringt. Uh, as if Marx had written, philosophers until now have interpreted uh, 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 the world uh, wrongly. Uh, it now, it's now, the question is now to find the good method of interpretation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't give this sentence a too instrumentalistic meaning. Yeah? Uh, as I mean, the instrumentalistic meaning would lead to the, to, to the idea that there is this box with different keys. And you have to, to choose the right key from that box. And I think the idea of constructing a key is much more going in the direction of aesthetic productivity, I think. Yeah? The, 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 the production by our aesthetic imagination. Like the, like the analyst, who also needs a lot of imag imagination in order to find the right clue to understand the symptom. Yeah? So it's more about construction than yeah. taking, taking an already prefigured key. Yeah, no, it, I mean, yeah, it would be contradictory with the whole essay, yeah. it seems yeah, to yeah, me, yeah. to be su suggesting that there would be in existence already in some way, right? But. And, and, you know, seems to possess a kind of figural value uh, that that is, that, that, that you know, exceeds uh, in that Benjaminian way, maybe even a dialectical capacity, uh, to the, the instrumental uh, interpretation and, and you know, utilitarian, Deweyan, whatever uh, uh, aspect of this. But, but I, I really was asking this in response to this larger question of, of instrumental reason that is so much associated with this kind of thinking that uh, that it, it perhaps, you know, to, to complement the, the point you just made, the point would be to devise an instrumentality adequate to philosophically to the situation as well as an interpretive reason. I don't know. You, you, uh, now you are not making the connection so strong as before, but before you, you connected this again back to the differentiation of different forms of reading yeah? of reading you wanted to defend to a certain degree what I have called negatively an instrumentalistic form of reading or I mean not defend it but, but reread it and you don't want to defend an instrumentalistic form of reading no uh, provocatively, perhaps, but I would say engaged, engaged. Now, the last question, which you've resisted, is how you would use these texts yourself, right? But you don't need to answer because I, 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 but I, because I have your book, The Idea of Socialism. And so I think I just would point to page 40, where you say, we must credit the early Frankfurt School under the direction of Max Horkheimer 
with being the first to present empirically founded doubts in the sociological fiction of a revolutionary working class. At any rate, the interdisciplinary studies on the authoritarianism of the working class set a process in motion which led to the insight that there is no automatic connection between a class-specific objective situation and certain desires or interests, right? And then a continuation of the discussion about um, socialist ideals and uh, stripping them of the kind of uh, industrial uh, revolution context. I, I suppose this would be a use of a, a, a use of the text um, in order to perhaps corroborate hmm, your uh, reimagination of the socialist idea as no longer being linked to a revolutionary working class and um, proletarian revolution and more towards maybe not reformism, but at least some kind of experimentalism, right? Dialogic instrumentalist. So we used to say engaged. It now let me reply in the most clever way. Huh? I mean, you are completely right. I, I'm taking there a book or an idea for purposes that do not are not in need of any deeper engagement with the text. Yeah? In that sense, I'm instrumentalizing one original idea of Horkheimer, I think. Uh, but I'm not even pretending that I'm reading something here. Yeah? I mean, making use of an idea is something completely innocent, I think. So I can say the Hegelian idea of reason has strange elements. Uh, no, that's not a good example. Let's, let's take a better example. Um, I could say that Benjamin's idea of the class struggle is very helpful in articulating some deeper psychological factors within the working class. Then I'm not engaged with the text. I'm making use of an idea without really, I mean, going deeper into it. So that kind of instrumental instrumentalism I found completely innocent. <laughs> and I think it's, is it using something as a toolbox? I thought it's an appreciation for, I mean, I mean, saving oneself the time to go deeper into that one idea by quoting it. It's quotation, probably. Citation. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I, I, I should leave it there. It definitely, but uh, I, I would contest, though, the idea that it doesn't depend on a reading. Um, but but I, I won't. Uh, so that we can, because we've tried your patience and we've gone over. Um, so. Uh, two things I want to do. First, uh, first I want to thank Axel Honneth for an extraordinary seminar. Uh, which I found fascinating and I learned a tremendous amount. So that was, and, and thank you for your, your questions and, uh, and, and our students for their posts, um, Tyler and uh, uh, Maximilian. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to say is that, so Critique 1313 goes international next. Uh, so anyone who's in Paris on October 16th can join us, but we will try to live stream also. It'll be just at noon rather than at six. But it'll be in Paris. We'll be reading uh, Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex with uh, Judith Revel uh, on October 16th. And then on October 22, we'll be in Rio in Brazil. And we'll be reading uh, Paulo Freire's uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed with uh, Maria Ines Marcondes de Souza uh, at the PUC, Rio University, Cecilio Baul, who's the theater director of the Theater of the Oppressed, Alessandra Vanucci of PUC, and Antonia Pele of PUC. We then will come back on November 13th, and I believe we will be right here in the same room to do Althusser 
with Etienne Balibar. So stay tuned and um, please join us. Uh, and text by, uh, reading, reading Kappa. Okay, so please join us uh, on and, and offline. Thank you.